Silverwood is the premier amusement park in the Pacific Northwest. This park is a great ride lineup in an amazing atmosphere, but unfortunately, not many coaster enthusiasts get to visit this park. This is because it's one of the more remote theme parks in the United States, as it is located in western Idaho. This makes it a difficult park to get to, but it is well worth it, and I'll explain why in this review. In 1973, the Henley Aerodrome opened in Athol, Idaho. This was a small airport. In 1981, Gary Norton purchased the property, but he ultimately wanted to transform it into a theme park. That happened in 1988 when Silverwood opened. It would be Idaho's first true amusement park in decades. The park had modest beginnings with a charming Main Street and just a few rides, but there were two standout attractions. First, there was a three mile long steam engine train. Second, there were air shows taking advantage of the site's former heritage. Over the next decade, Silverwood transformed into a full-fledged amusement park. They relocated a series of rides, most notably Knott's Berry Farm's former corkscrew, which was the first modern looping coaster. And they created the Roller Coaster Alley section of the park with two notable wood coasters from CCI. This is what really put the park on the map with coaster enthusiasts. Silver was continued to expand since the new millennium, adding the Boulder Beach Water Park and a few large steel roller coasters. The newest is Stunt Pilot, which pays homage to the air shows that were discontinued in 1996 after a tragic accident. And while the park has expanded, they have maintained their charm. Part of that is because of the friendly employees, but it's also because the park feels way older than it truly is, and I mean that as a compliment. Silverwood feels like one of the classic amusement parks found on the East Coast. It's a mix of the architecture and rides, but the park has kept up with the times by preserving their old classics, while also adding flashy modern thrillers. This park reminds me of Kennywood in many ways, both good and bad, and I'll explain more about that as this review progresses. It also has elements of a Hershen park like Silver Dollar City or Dollywood between the retro nature and small pockets of theming. So much so that Hershend actually tried to acquire the park a few years ago, but Silverwood's owners declined. This park also has an amazing setting. The Pacific Northwest is a gorgeous section of the country. You have a mountain backdrop and plenty of tree coverage within the park itself. Silverwood's tallest rides take advantage of this location to offer stunning views, but this location is a blessing and a curse because it's a royal pain to get to this park unless you're a local. This is not an easy park to incorporate into a coaster road trip. There is not another amusement park for hundreds of miles. Both times I've visited Silverwood, I have tacked it onto a work trip in Seattle. Silverwood is about five hours away from there and I've had no qualms making that drive given the park's quality. If you want to make a dedicated trip just for Silverwood, I think your best option if you're coming from a distance is to fly into Spokane, Washington. I know it may be hard to find a flight there, but Silverwood is just a one hour drive from there. And you'll definitely need a car to get here, no ifs, ands, or buts about it. This park makes one heck of a first impression though as you drive up to it, you see Aftershock poking above the trees. Then the park essentially uses Timber Terror as a billboard. This wood coaster runs alongside the highway, and it has a sign bearing the park's name. Parking costs $10. You park across the street. Then you walk through a tunnel underneath Route 95. It is a similar entry experience to several palace entertainment parks like Storyland, Lake Compounds, and the aforementioned Kennywood. Silverwood is one of the pricier theme parks out there though. You are paying for quality, and the fact there's no competition for miles probably factors in. As of 2024, day tickets cost $84, but you can get a $10 discount if you buy in advance online. These prices include both the amusement and water park. The park also offers an after 4pm admission for $55, but I think you'll want a full day at this park anyway. They also offer a two-day ticket for $125. I think you can comfortably do mostly everything in a day, 
but this is a nice option if you want to move at a more relaxed pace or if you want plenty of time for rerides. This is the ticket I used with my recent trip. Since the park is so difficult to get to, I wanted to maximize my time there. The park has an RV park and campground nearby, but there are not any hotels in the immediate vicinity of the park. You can find plenty of hotels a half hour drive away though. Silverwood's layout is a tad odd, but simple to navigate. This park is very long and narrow. You enter a main street area, then you go right for Boulder Beach Water Park, or left for the amusement park. Then the amusement park is comprised of a few lightly themed areas. Country Carnival is the largest area. This feels like the county fair section of Dollywood, just more fleshed out. You have all sorts of classic amusement rides in close proximity. But towards the back, you have some western theming by the Thunder Canyon River Rapids ride. My personal favorite area is Roller Coaster Alley. This is the back section of the park, and it's home to the park's best attractions. You have the five largest roller coasters and two wild flat rides. This is where most thrill seekers will want to spend a majority of their day. By contrast, young kids will want to spend a lot of their time in Critter Camp. This is a woodsy kitty area with roughly a dozen attractions in close proximity. Then you have the aforementioned Main Street which has a timeless vibe between the music and assortment of shops. Arguably the biggest con with this park is the operations. I don't fault the individual operators. There are three main issues here. Vehicle availability, operational policies, and staffing. One, almost every coaster at Silverwood will run just one train. That's not because the park chooses to. Rather, they have to. Most coasters are not configured to have multiple trains. For example, the wood coasters don't even have transfer tracks built. This becomes very problematic on busy days for the rides in Roller Coaster Alley. The only coaster at this park that has and will run multiple trains is Stunt Pilot. Two, the load procedures in some rides increase dispatch times. In the past, the operators on the wood coaster first need to perform seatbelt checks. They would then need to perform a second pass to check the lap bars. Fortunately, both these checks were performed at the same time in my 2023 visits on Timber Terror and Tremors, but this practice was still in place in Aftershock. 3. Staffing seems to be a major issue, and that's not too surprising given this park's remote location. To the park's defense, ride availability is not the problem. I have seen maybe just a flat ride or two close my visits to this park. Rather, it is the number of crew members assigned to each attraction. Almost every park has at least two attendants working a large scale roller coaster. This is so responsibilities can be split up and they can each check one side of the train. But I have seen both Timber Terror and Tremors with just a single employee multiple times. This means a single employee needs to close the exit gate open the air gates, check both sides of the train, and then get back to the operator booth to dispatch said train. This often led to 5-6 to six minute dispatches. And I don't fault the operators, they were moving at a good clip. They just had so much on their plate and had to follow the policies in place. When the wood coasters have had two operators or more, usually towards the middle of the day, dispatches are far swifter. As a result, you may encounter some lengthy waits in busier days, especially on weekends. The longest line consistently seems to be Timber Terror. I've seen this wait hover around the 45 to 60 minute mark. I recommend starting off with this ride. Then I've seen half hour waits consistently for Tremors, Spin Cycle, and Aftershock. These four rides tend to have shorter waits during the first hour and then during the last two or so hours of the day. And if by some chance their lines don't die down, you can hop in line right before closing time. Now an important note about Aftershock. This is the most weather sensitive ride at the park. This ride cannot operate in the rain, nor high winds, and it also needs to be at least 60 degrees to open. The latter is the main reason this ride is not even available during the scary wood Halloween season. The two main water rides in Roaring Creek Log Flume and Thunder Canyon can get long waits midday on warmer days. 
I usually wait to ride these around sunset when the crowds die down. Then there are two old school flat rides that have painstakingly slow load procedures. So much so that they have signs apologizing for their low capacity. Those are the Ferris wheel and the paratrooper. These rides can only load one gondola at a time. Stunt Pile is the park's newest roller coaster, and lines usually are not a major issue on this one. I would advise saving this one until the afternoon for two reasons. One, it warms up noticeably. Two, the capacity improves as the day progresses, as the ride tends to start with just one train, and a second one will be added one or two hours into the day. You can also find lines at the Boulder Beach Water Park. If the water park is a priority, I would recommend starting your day over there. I suspect the new for 2024 Eagle Hunt water coaster will draw the longest queues going forward, so I would make that your new first stop. Then I would head towards Ricochet Rapids and Avalanche Mountain, as these two slides consistently are the longest queue lines through the 2023 season. You can then switch to the amusement park in the early afternoon. Now let's talk about this park's ride lineup in depth. This park currently has seven different roller coasters, many of which were touched by Rocky Mountain construction or RMC in some capacity. RMC is now one of the most popular roller coaster manufacturers in the world. They are located just down the road in Hayden, Idaho, but they got their start erecting rides for Silverwood. This included roller coasters like Tremors and the entire Boulder Beach water park. Over the past decade, They've added special track to Tremors and Timber Terror to reduce maintenance and improve smoothness. And they finally built a coaster of their own at Silverwood in Stunt Pilot. This is a single rail coaster. This rides a nearly identical layout to the original Raptor coasters, but there were a few changes. This ride received a longer 10 car train to boost capacity, but this caused a few elements to be modified. This toned down a few of them, but this is still a fast-paced and wild experience. The first drop, S-Hill, and drop midway through all offer very strong ejector airtime in the back row specifically. Then the coaster throws in some near misses in the second half while navigating the last two inversions. This is the best ride of marathon at this park between the minimal lines, smoothness, and dynamic experience. Aftershock is the park's most intense coaster, this is a Vacoma giant inverted boomerang relocated from Six Flags Great America. This rides two gigantic spikes reaching nearly hyper heights. These offer large vertical drops that'll feel like something from a drop tower. Then the three inversions are loaded with positive G's, and they're super disorienting when you take them backwards. There is some headbanging though on the Cobra Roll, which is unpleasant given this ride's intensity, but the ride ultimately is enjoyable overall. Timber Terror was the park's first wood coaster. Built by Custom Coasters International or CCI, this is an out-and-back coaster. The outward leg is solid, offering some nice floater airtime. Then the return run has some weak airtime. But this ride was hurt by some recent changes. The old buzz bars were replaced by more restrictive individual lap bars. Then the steel track added by RMC lessened the laterals on the far turnaround as well as the Helix Finale, but these bits are smooth and still offer decent laterals. The coaster is still fun, but it was better a few years ago. Tremors is the park's far better wood coaster. I love this ride's layout. It has four underground tunnels and a mix of airtime hills and turns. This one also got some steel track that reduced the laterals, but they're still strong and sustained at points, most notably on that giant Helix. Then there are some great spots of airtime. The first drop has a very abrupt ejector kink in the back row. Then the speed hills offer oodles of floater airtime throughout the train. And if you're at this park on a day with a late close, prioritize a night ride in this coaster. It is a very dark experience. Corkscrew is a classic. I admire its historical impact on the amusement industry as a whole as it was the first modern looping coaster. But this arrow creation is not perfect. It is super short, and the rise quite bumpy, particularly on any pullout or directional change. But I do enjoy the sharp air time in the first drop in the back car. And the corkscrews are picturesque. 
Crazy Coaster was one of the very first SPF Visa spinning coasters, and it's an enjoyable ride for all ages. It is small in size, so it's approachable for kids. Then the spinning adds a smidge of thrills to appease to older guests as well. Tiny 2 is a super small powered coaster from Zamperla. This is the park's true kitty coaster. Adults can ride this for the credit if they so desire, but this is an embarrassing one to ride if you don't have any kids with you. While on the topic of kitty rides, most of them will be in the aforementioned Critter Camp area, but there are a few others peppered throughout the park. Then there are some larger rides with no minimum height requirement that are also kid friendly. One such ride is the Steam Engine Train. This is arguably the best train ride at any theme park, and it is a can't miss attraction. This is a 30 minute experience, and it's narrated too by tour guides. The start takes you past the water park. The end takes you around the amusement park. But the meat of the journey takes place in the woods. At one point, you will pass a herd of real buffalo. Then you pass all sorts of animal statues and figures, some of which will interact with the train. But the highlight is the show scene midway through the experience. And depending when you ride, you will get a different show. Check the schedule out front to see which one you're going to get. I got a shootout in my recent trip, but I've also had a robbery in the past. Another scenic attraction worth checking out is the Ferris Wheel. This offers great views of the park and nearby mountains. For larger flat rides, this park is a handful of classic spinning rides. Then you have two major thrill rides that should not be missed. Panic Plunge is a 14-story tall drop tower. This is a Larson ARM model. You are slowly hauled up to the top, giving you plenty of time to take in your surroundings. Then you drop with no warning, and that drop is gut-wrenching. You drop like a rock and float the whole way down. It is fantastic and even beats some drop towers over twice as tall. Spin Cycle is a unique frisbee from SBF. This one deliberately rotates slowly. This designs out the positive and negative G's. Instead, it goes all in on hang time, and it is one of the best rides in the world for hang time. You hover out of your seat for seconds at a time. It's pretty freaky how long you're inverted on this ride, but I love it. Moving on to the water rides, there are three available. Thunder Canyon is a Hopkins River Rapids ride in the woods. This one is a soaker, as there are a series of rapids that'll get your lower half drenched. Then there's also a sizable waterfall that'll hit at least half the boat. Roaring Creek Log Flume is an older arrow flume ride relocated from Kentucky Kingdom. Despite that fact, the layout is scenic as you pass all sorts of trees and even a cave. It felt like it's been here all along. The final drop is fairly small, but it's still fun. Just know you can potentially come off this one soaked. It's not the drop, rather, there are two geysers, one after the final splashdown, and one hidden midway through the ride. If either goes off, you will be drenched head to toe. Then there are the bumper boats. I love the placement of this ride by the paratrooper. This is another one where it's nearly impossible to come off dry because the boats are equipped with water guns. Moving on to the offerings at the Boulder Beach Water Park, the most thrilling slide here is Velocity Peak. This is three different speed slides. The triple down is just okay, but I really like the other two. The giant drop offers a smidge of air time at the start. Then the enclosed twisty one is the star. It has great speed and pace. Then there are some wild turns, particularly a forceful helix towards the start. Ricochet Rapids is a family raft slide that starts off with a little funnel section with a little bit of airtime and some turbulent swaying. The rest of the experience is fairly mild though. Avalanche Mountain is a more consistent family raft slide start to finish. This one is a long windy course down a hill. There are not many drops in this one, but the turns can be wild with a heavier boat. You are really pushed up them and it feels like your raft may even fold over. Rumble Falls is a quartet of tube slides. Two of them are fully enclosed, one is half enclosed, and the other is fully open. The four otherwise feel similar as their routes are fairly tame, minus a surprise turn or two that pushes your raft up the wall. Riptide Racer is a mat racing slide. 
The competitive aspect is great, but this exact slide can be found at a lot of other parks. Through the 2023 season, I thought the slide lineup was solid, but it was missing an undisputed standout slide. That'll be fixed in 2024 with Eagle Hunt. This is a dueling water coaster. The racing aspect is a unique touch for this type of slide. Then the layout should be fast paced. I am just hoping the drops are steep enough to offer some airtime along the way. Kids will find some smaller slides in the Pollywog Park section of the park. Then the smallest of guests can have the Toddler Springs Spray Ground available to them as well. Then everyone can relax in the Elkhorn Creek Lazy River or the Boulder Beach Bay Wave Pool on those hot summer days. Beyond the rides and slides, this park also has some shows. The best is easily the Magic Show. I recommend arriving early to guarantee a seat on a busy day. The magicians have excellent showmanship, and there are some mind-blowing tricks during the performance. The park has some games as well. There are all sorts of paid midway games, but I particularly like the arcade with some pinball machines. Moving on to the food, this is another area where Silverwood shines. While park admission is pricey, food prices are quite reasonable compared to other parks. And I like the quality of the items too. There's a full service sit down restaurant in Lindy's towards the front of the park and I've heard good things about it. And I have also heard multiple people rave about this park's ice cream. The pizza by the magic show is also solid, but my favorite place to eat here is the burrito place by Timber Terror. The portions and taste are great. All of my visits have taken place during the summer months, so I have not experienced the park's scary wood Halloween event. I saw some of the sets from the train, but I've heard it's solid for a park of this size. Then you have the unique experience of trying Timber Terror backwards. So do I recommend Silverwood? If you can get there, absolutely. This is a marvelous park between the charm, atmosphere, and ride lineup. There are several good coasters here, and the top two of Stunt Pilot and Tremors is quite strong. Then there are some standout flat rides, cool water rides, and that amazing train. And it also helps there's a sizable water park included as well. I do wish the operations were faster on some of the coasters, but the park does a great job in nearly every other category. This is an annoying park to access, but it is well worth the trouble in my opinion. The coaster lineup alone makes it the best park in all of the Pacific Northwest. And when you add in everything else this park does well, it is easily the star in the region. So those are my thoughts on Silverwood. What are your thoughts about this park? Have you been there? Let me know down in the comments. If you enjoyed this review, I would appreciate it if you gave this video a like and you consider subscribing because there'll be a lot more roller coaster amusement park videos here at Canopy Coaster. Thanks for watching.